Welcome back to the Der Show. It was remarkable to see my old friend Henry Kissinger um, uh, make a talk at 100 years old about artificial intelligence. I can tell you one thing, artificial intelligence will never be as smart as, as Henry Kissinger. Um, you know, he, he, he um, with his, his accent has gotten deeper as he's got older, so he's a little harder to understand. But the brilliance that emanates from his mind, I mean, he was just born a strategist. I first uh, met him when he was writing about nuclear strategy, nuclear policy, and you remember the history. Uh, Nelson Rockefeller, who was then running for president, um, um, asked him to be his advisor on nuclear strategy, and, um, and he was. And uh, then when Nixon became the nominee, he switched over to Nixon and became one of the few people ever in history, maybe the only person who was both national security advisor to the president and then secretary of state. Controversial, obviously, bombing of Cambodia, you name it, uh, where he, wherever he goes, there are still occasionally protests. But uh, what a remarkable life. I mean, he was born in, in Germany, uh, managed to escape the Holocaust, come to America, and uh, live the American dream. Uh, you might not like everything he stands for, but what what a reflection on America. If he hadn't left America, you know what would have happened to him. He would have been murdered along with six million other Jews, many of them very accomplished, uh, like Henry Kissinger. I once made a speech in Hamburg to a bunch of lawyers, about a thousand of them, very few, maybe a handful of Jews in the audience. And I asked them, how many of you think you were victim, victimized by the Holocaust? And the, the six Jews raised their hand. And then I said to the audience of non-Jewish Germans, how many of you have lost a close relative to cancer? A lot of hands. Heart condition, a lot of hands. Diabetes, a lot of hands. How many of your, your family have had Alzheimer's? Lots of hands. I said, how do you know that the cures or at least the ameliorative for those horrible illnesses did not go up in smoke in Auschwitz? Uh, we don't know. We're just not sure. Um, it could have been Einstein who was uh, murdered. It could have been Sigmund Freud. It could have been the people who gave us the atomic bomb to end the, the, the Second uh, World War. We just don't know how damaging uh, the horrible Holocaust uh, was, uh, not only to Jews, but to humanity in general. And so today, <laughs> I want to talk about Jews. I've talked about Jews in the past, but it's the subject of, of today's discussion because Donald Trump sent a very controversial Rosh Hashanah message out. Uh, all politicians send out Rosh Hashanah messages to uh, their Jewish constituents. And he said, just a quick reminder for liberal Jews, now I'm a liberal Jew, for liberal Jews who voted to destroy America and Israel because you believed in false narratives. Let's hope you learn from your mistake and make better choices moving forward. Happy New Year. I took that as a somewhat personal message. I mean, I, uh, it wasn't directed at me. I'm a liberal Jew. I voted against Donald Trump. I support Israel. And I don't think I voted for, uh, for uh, Israel's uh, destruction. I, I do acknowledge, not only acknowledge, I announce that uh, there's never been a better president since Harry Truman, who recognized Israel when the State Department didn't want to do it. The State Department was a bastion of anti-Semitism. Um, um, and Roosevelt uh, listened to the State Department. Roosevelt probably would not have recognized uh, um, Israel. He was much too beholden to the bigots in the State Department, but Truman did. Since Truman, um, Lyndon Johnson was great for Israel. He, I think, made it possible for Israel to develop nuclear uh, capacity. Um, and many American presidents have been okay. Um, Barack Obama was not very good. Um, in fact, he was quite bad, particularly in the last uh, part of his uh, second term. But Trump was great. I consulted with Trump on a number of occasions about uh, uh, the Middle East. I consulted with him about the Golan Heights, about Jerusalem. I consulted with him about uh, the uh, peace process, the Abraham Accords. I was at the White House when, um, and I was at the uh, opening of the uh, embassy in Jerusalem um, with my grandson. We, we were there as guests of both Prime Minister Netanyahu and, uh, and of President Trump. So. 
you're not going to ever get me to say that Donald Trump was not the best president for Israel. But like most Jews and like most Americans, we're not single issue voters. We vote on a range of issues. And um, Donald Trump has asked me on numerous occasions, why don't your people vote for me? And my answer is always first, I don't have any people. You know, I vote myself, my wife. My wife doesn't even uh, trust who I vote for. I think I may have told you this story. We had an absentee ballot in the last presidential election, and I said I was going to vote for Biden. And my wife said, are you sure you're not going to vote for Trump? And I said, no, I'm going to vote for Biden. So she took out a, her, her iPhone camera and said, all right, I'm videotaping you. Fill in the blank. Let me see who you're voting for. So I you know, filled in the, 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 the ballot for, uh, for Biden, and my wife turned off the camera, and I persuaded her that I voted for, 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 for Biden. I don't know who I'm going to vote for in the next election. I, I never decide until more information is in. I hope there'll be some debates and uh, we'll see what happens. Um, but um, Donald Trump sh should not have sent a message like that for, for, for Rosh Hashanah. Um, Jews have a right to vote whoever they want to vote for. And, um, and, um, uh, Many Jews, particularly Jews who um, uh, focus heavily on support for Israel, as they have the right to do, um, uh, probably will vote for for Donald Trump. Others will be ambivalent, and some will vote will vote against him. My current plan is to vote against him. Never know. You never know. You never know who's going to be running for president when you have two people who are close to or are octogenarians. Um, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot. I, ju I just looked up, uh, weirdly for insurance purposes. I looked up my own, um, longevity. I'm I just turned 85. And according to the statistical tables, I have a 75% chance of living for two more years, 75% chance, 25% chance. I won't make it, uh, for, for two years. And, um, you can go back and, and check, uh, Biden and Trump their ages and how likely it is that either of them would survive um, a four-year term. And uh, so, you know, the issue in the next campaign may very well focus on who the vice presidential candidate uh, is, because the vice presidential candidate of the winning candidate may very well be the next, um, the next president. But I want to talk a little bit more generally about, uh, about Jews. Um, my wife uh, goes to a reform synagogue. We're a mixed marriage. She's reform synagogue, and I go to an orthodox synagogue. That, that doesn't mean we're s more separated than we would be if she came to an orthodox synagogue. Because if she came to an orthodox synagogue, she'd be sitting upstairs in the balcony, and I'd be sitting downstairs. We have separate seating for men and women. But if I went to her synagogue, I could sit next to her, but I like to go. And, and you, two of a more traditional synagogue. I love my cantor, um, uh, cantor uh, health god, and I, I love my rabbi, and I love the services. So I, I go to the Orthodox service and sit, sit separately uh, from my wife. My wife went to the Reform service, and the rabbi who presided, uh, Rabbi Bookdahl, who's excellent, she's a great cantor, singer, and also a great rabbi, she talked about judicial reform in Israel, which many people think is an inappropriate subject to talk about in Rosh Hashanah. It was supposed to be a spiritual time, not a time about divisive political talk. But she's going to be leading efforts to go to the United Nations on Friday. She and uh, Rabbi Cosgrove, who's an excellent conservative rabbi in, um, in Manhattan, at Fifth Avenue Synagogue, um, uh, Park Avenue Synagogue, I'm not sure, one of those, or maybe the Park Avenue Synagogue, uh, are going to be leading demonstrations against Israel in front of the United Nations. That's just wrong. The United Nations is a place of great hatred for Israel. The United Nations condemns Israel more than all the other countries of the world combined. And when rabbis are condemning Israel in front of the United Nations, it simply lends support to bigots, anti-Semites, and enemies of of Israel. These rabbis are not protesting the head of Iran or the head of the Palestinian Authority. The head of the Palestinian Authority, Mohammed Abbas, who I've met and had dinner with, recently made the most outrageous statement. He said Hitler didn't kill the Jews because of religion or race or ethnicity. He killed them because they were users and moneylenders. But what about a million babies and children 
were they usurers and money lenders? Shame, shame on you, Muhammad Abbas. Every rabbi should be standing in front of the United Nations and protesting him. And every American, whatever your religion, should be protesting Mohammed Abbas, uh, who is the head of a kleptocracy, uh, a government that hasn't been elected and hasn't had elections in years and steals money from their poor people. Uh, but, you know, that's politics. But the idea that the head of the Palestinian Authority would say that essentially Jews deserve their fate uh, because they were moneylenders and usurers. What do you think that some Jews were moneylenders? They weren't allowed to own property. They were only allowed uh, by the government to be involved in, in financial affairs. And, and that's why, um, you know, the Shylock uh, character in Merchant of Venice reflected the reality of, of British law. Um, British law had separate rules for Jews and everybody else. You couldn't be a member of parliament. You couldn't be in the business of selling land or owning land, uh, many other restrictions. So yeah, Jews went into what occupations they were allowed to go into and many of them went into business and uh, business involved um, uh, renting products and one product that you rent is money. And when you rent a product, whether it's an apartment or a million dollars, you expect to be paid for your rental costs. And that's what money lending is. It's just um, what banks do and what individuals do before there were banks. In any event, uh, these rabbis should be ashamed of themselves. And anybody else who goes in front of the UN and lends their good name to blood libels against Israel, calling it apartheid or genocidal or uh, undemocratic. I mean, even if all the so-called judicial reforms were to be enacted by uh, the Knesset, um, which I oppose, and by the way, so does Benjamin Netanyahu oppose. He doesn't believe in, in some of the provisions that are in the judicial reform. He believes in others. But even if all of them were enacted, Israel would be like New Zealand and, and, and like Sweden and like uh, Denmark and like Norway and like Great Britain. Most Western democracies have little or no judicial review at all. Judicial review is an American invention. It's so interesting because in the United States, it's the left that wants to weaken the Supreme Court because they think it's too conservative. They want to pack the court. I don't remember very many rabbis uh, objecting to that or very many Israelis coming over and objecting to how America decides its court should deal with justice. Um, but um, uh, Israel would become like most other Western. It would still be much more democratic than almost any country at the United Nations, except for, you know, maybe a handful. But uh, no country is more democratic than Israel, as evidenced by the protests that occur every week, every week, every weekend. Uh, they petition their government for a redress of grievances, exercising what is the equivalent of their First Amendment rights. It's a dem democratic country. They had five elections in four years. My God, what could be more democratic than that? A lot of the people who are protesting, especially these rabbis, uh, they don't like Netanyahu. They don't like his party. Well, fine, move to Israel and vote on the other side. But, but you have no right to uh, protest uh, the election that Israel had any more than Israel had a right to protest when uh, Trump was elected or when uh, Biden was elected. It's none of your damn business. Uh, Israel is a vibrant democracy. It can deal with its own internal problems. It can decide <clears throat> how much judicial review is appropriate for its country. And we shouldn't be having uh, protests at the European community or in other parts of the world against what, what, what Israel is doing, but even if there are to be protests, all right, protest in front of Netanyahu's hotel, protest in front of the Israeli embassy. Do not protest in front of the United Nations. That is a place of anti-Semitism, a place of hatred, a place where the head of Iran is given a, tumultu a, tum a tumultuous welcome, as is the head of the Palestinian Authority. Um, whereas you hear the, the head of the United States who spoke today, you know, somewhat more muted um, 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 applause as well as uh, Israel and other countries. So there's a time and a place for everything. And 
the United Nations on Friday, the day that Benjamin Netanyahu, representing the state of Israel, is speaking for the nation of Israel, the nation state of the Jewish people. That is not the time. And the United Nations is not the place. If any of you are members of either of those congregations um, that uh, Rabbi Buchtel and Rabbi Cosgrove and any of the other rabbis who will be there, protest to them. Tell them what you think. Tell them why it's wrong to go in front of the United Nations. I have an article about it in today's Jerusalem Post. Um, you can read that online. It makes <clears throat> some of the same points I'm, I'm making here. Um, and so I am, I am scandalized by these rabbis. Um, I don't know what they're thinking. Um, do you know, Theodor Herzl, the founder of, um, of um, Zionism, in his book, The Jewish State, said essentially, rabbis, stay in your synagogues. No, teach the Torah, learn the Torah. But Adam, things like judicial reform, you don't know what you're talking about. <clears throat> I challenge Rabbi Buckdahl or Rabbi Cosgrove to debate me on the issue of judicial reform. I happen to be on their side, but I know something about it, and they don't. They have no idea what they're talking about when they say that somehow this will make Israel an undemocratic country. In fact, when you think about it logically, it's judicial, ref it's judicial review that is somewhat undemocratic in character. You have appointed judges striking down legislation enacted by popularly elected members of the Knesset or members of Congress. Judicial review is by its very nature somewhat undemocratic. And, and yet they say, oh, democracy will end in Israel if judicial review is somewhat more limited than it is today. In Israel, you don't even have to have standing to challenge legislation. Anybody can walk in off the street and say, you know, I don't like that law you just passed. Why don't you strike it down as, as illegal? Israel doesn't have a written constitution, so it's a little hard to figure out sometimes how they strike them down. They use a concept called reasonableness, and that has now, the Knesset has abolished that, and the Supreme Court is now considering whether to uphold the abolition of reasonableness as a criteria for judicial review. These are technical, interesting complicated issues of the kind that ought to be debated in law schools. It's not an issue that should result in street protests, and it is certainly not an issue that should bring rabbis to the United Nations to protest Israel and to lend support for those who claim that Israel is an apartheid or a genocidal state. There are apartheid and genocidal states, and these rabbis don't protest them. Shame on them. Shame on them, particularly during these holy days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, to devote their time not to the spiritual needs of their communities, but to uh, controversial issues about which they know nothing. Shame on them. So let's take some letters. Okay, this is an interesting one. I got about 10 of these. Rule of thumb. Remember, I talked about how the rule of thumb back in the days of the common law was that you could beat your wife with a stick as long as it was less wide than your thumb. So I got a lot of letters saying, rule of thumb is an urban legend. It's absurd to pretend it's historical, let alone projecting it onto America specifically. Well, we don't know whether it's an urban legend or not. We do know it goes back to the 18th century. Here's a cartoon that appeared um, in 1782, um, uh, and it's the man who allegedly, the judge who allegedly articulated the rule of thumb. Whether, whether he did or not is not important. The important thing is it was recognized um, by many uh, as having been the law. And, and, and this cartoon um, uh, talked about it has, it has the, the, the judge who purportedly did this. Remember, we're talking about 1782 with a group of sticks and they're called thumb sticks because they're thinner than the thumb and the 1782 cartoon um, um, suggested that you could beat your wife um, as long as it's with a stick 
thinner than the thumb. So it's not an urban legend. It may not be a completely accurate description of the common law, but when something goes back to 1782 and when it's been cited by courts, it's a little bit more than an urban legend. So, uh, so those of you who told me to get my facts straight, I did. I checked. I went back, did the research, and sure enough, it's a more complicated issue than many of you think. All right, here's some more letters. The government has a firm policy that a guilty plea must include a waiver of appeal. No, that's not right. Okay. Uh, except for habeas petitions for ineffective assistance of counsel. No, that's not right. Hence, unless Hunter Biden has extended more special treatment, your prediction will not come to fruition. That's just not the case. You have what's called a stipulated plea agreement, which means that the person admits the facts but contests the law. And it's not common, but it's done. And the government doesn't always demand that a person give up his appellate rights. It's it, usually a traditional plea bargain does give up appellate rights. But when you have a stipulated plea of this kind, it, it changes the situation. OK, how about people that got jail time for the same offense as Hunter Biden. Oh, I forgot. He's the son of a Democratic president. No, let's get the facts straight. Almost nobody is ever prosecuted simply for failing to file a report of drug abuse on a gun application. I challenge anybody to find me cases like that. You can't. They don't exist. Um, what happens is the gun charge is added to the robbery charge or the assault charge. And then the person gets additional jail time for these three violations of the gun laws. But in, I don't know, maybe there are cases. I don't know of cases where a first offender is sent to jail um, as the result of um, a guilty finding or plea without any prior offenses and unrelated to any other crime. So no, it's not because he's the president's son. Indeed, maybe he's being prosecuted because he's the president's son. Maybe if he were John Doe, he would not be prosecuted at all. So be careful about the allegations that, that you make. Um, okay, let's go back to guns. Scalia began his opinion with, quote, like most rights, the right secured by the Second Amendment is not unlimited. And people forget about that. And of course they forget about it because Justice Thomas forgot about it. And he's written an opinion since that makes it somewhat more absolute than I think Scalia had in mind when he wrote it. OK, don't impeach Biden. Let Biden run in his record and let him be the face of the Democratic Party. Let good men like Professor Dershowitz, who support his corrupt party, eventually they will come, understand, eventually they will come for the professor and we will do nothing because no one will have the capability to restore the Constitution of the United States. No, look, I agree with you. I don't want to have him uh, impeached or um, removed from ballots either side. I want to see an election between whoever the nominees are of the Republican and the Democratic Party. I want to see Trump lose. That's my personal view at this point in time. That may change over time, but right now I want to see him lose and I want to see him lose in a fair election. That's why I want to have an election commission appointed, uh, which we don't have in the United States, which most countries do. We need it more than ever for the next election of very distinguished nonpartisan people to whom um, complaints about the election can be brought on an ongoing real-time basis. I think that would really, really help secure um, a fair election and not leave it open to what's happened since in the last couple of years. Um, why are you double talking? You know, Biden is evil and you are backing him. Biden is not evil. No, I, I don't agree with you. Um, I think Biden's a nice man, as I've said before. He may not be the most effective president. That's for you to decide. But I know him enough to know he's he's not evil. Trump won, and Biden is the worst president in American history. He will forever be known as a puppet president. Who's pulling the strings, I wonder? Uh, I, I don't see him as, as, a, as a puppet, and Trump didn't win. Uh, once you said that bribery and its opposite being bribed were equivalent offenses. What about extortion? I believe Biden did both. Look, I haven't seen the evidence, but if Biden 
is guilty of extortion. That is an impeachable offense. I think, although it's not specifically in the Constitution, when it says treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors, other high crimes means crimes similar to bribery. And extortion is a crime similar to a bribery. And so, yeah, if evidence emerges of extortion while he was president, a bunch of the letters also raise the question, what about if you can prove that he committed a, a, an offense, a, an impeachable offense before he was president? And the answer to that is very clear. Nobody knows. That's the only answer. Nobody knows. We don't know whether or not uh, a person who committed impeachable offenses while he was vice president um, years earlier um, can be impeached while he's president. We just don't know the answer to that question. We'll come back to that and other questions of great interest uh, tomorrow on The Der Show. See you then.